Welcome back to EE for Everyone. As you well know, June is Funky Switch Mode Power Supply Appreciation Month, and we're just about out of time. So I thought we might want to discuss the new and improved, never before discussed on YouTube, Sepic Switch Mode Power Supply. Hmm, what's that? Oh. As luck would have it, Great Scott released a video on the Sepic converter, which he called Epic, just, hmm, what's that? Yesterday? Ah, come on. Now, I did watch his video, and honestly, I thought it was great. Unfortunate timing, but great video. And while it was great, I also thought that there was enough difference in our angles that I could release something that would contribute to this conversation as well. When you're done here, head over to his channel, get a little more information and background on the theory of operation and how the SEPIC converter works. Fair play, great Scott, and nice work. Many of you may be familiar with switch mode power supplies. There are a ton of switch mode power supply topologies. Invented sometime after <laughs> the year 1900, we've continued to iterate and develop better power supply technologies beyond the first, which were most likely buck and boost. I was hoping to share the more specific dates that especially the SEPIC was designed, but I really just couldn't find a good source. Some articles are saying 1920s, others are saying 1970s. That's a pretty big difference. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter because the physics is the same regardless of the year the SEPIC was invented. So let's just get into all those details, how this thing works. And if you happen to be really skilled in history and you know the history of this converter, you have some links or comments, uh, please leave them down below. I am pretty confident that the SEPIC was designed in the later phases of switch mode power supply development, which is still ongoing. It just, it's not the most intuitive first starting point. Uh, it is really interesting though. The SEPIC is super interesting because it can produce a voltage above, below, or equal to the input voltage with a single MOSFET. And specifically, that MOSFET has low side drive rather than high side drive. So that means that we only need a voltage of something like 5 to 15 volts with reference to ground rather than needing 5 to 15 volts above the input voltage. That is pretty cool, and it leads to a very simple gate drive architecture and a relatively low-cost power supply. That is awesome. Comparing to the buck boost, there's four switches, two of which need high side drive. This is a big improvement. Now, there's something that I was trying to find a quick answer to, and it should have been a quick yes-no answer, but I couldn't find one, which was kind of surprising, and that was the inspiration for this video. I couldn't find a clear answer for whether or not a SEPIC converter needed to be resonant. I look at the circuit, I see a bunch of inductors and capacitors, enough of them to say, yeah, there's probably some energy sloshing around between these parts. But what exactly is resonance again? It can get a little abstract, and I think this would be better if we define resonance figure out whether or not resonance is critical for the function of a SEPIC converter. And while we're in all these details, let's just have some fun and play around, do some experiments to confirm what we suspect. The best definition that I've found for resonance is when the reactance of an inductor is equal in magnitude and opposite in sign to the reactance of a capacitor. This is for a particular circuit. Due to the characteristic equations, which is Z equals J omega L for an inductor, and Z equals 1 over J omega C for a capacitor, where omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency, a particular circuit will only be resonant at one frequency. The SEPIC circuit is complicated. Some inductors are or are not present, depending on which way current is flowing. Some elements may or may not end up being in the circuit, so it's not just J omega L, one of which J omega C, this is a little more complicated. Because of that, rather than sit here and derive a system of equations and spend all afternoon, let's just head over to LT Spice and see if we can learn enough in simulation to move on and get a clear answer here. By monitoring the voltages and currents near the outputs of the SEPIC, so that's in that resonant network, or possibly resonant network of 
inductors and capacitor, we can see a damped oscillation. It's pretty clear, a damped oscillation. Okay, oscillation means resonant, right? Well, not so fast. I believe the SEPIC circuit is best described as an oscillatory circuit because the arrangement of reactive components used here is naturally leading to a damped alternating current from a voltage impulse. Just because energy is sloshing around between these parts doesn't mean that it's resonant. Remember, resonant is that frequency where the reactance of the inductive and capacitive elements is equal and opposite in magnitude. Now, I do need to say something that might be obvious to some, but we'll just move right past it. If we were to drive this SEPIC at or near the resonant frequency, we would likely see a significant, measurable increase in efficiency. Driving near the resonant frequency causes a lower voltage to be present around that primary MOSFET while it's switching, which leads to lower switching losses and higher efficiency. But that isn't unique to a SEPIC. That is a concept called zero voltage switching, or ZVS, and that concept can be applied to many switching power supply topologies. So does it apply here? Yes. Is it critical to how the SEPIC works? No. They're using the straight, normal operating modes of inductors and capacitors to move energy bit by bit, much like any other switch mode power supply. Precision in language is important, and let's confirm some assumptions. So our experiments today will be centered around the LT8362 dev kit in the SEPIC configuration. You can order it in three different configurations. It is based off of a module, uh, has a lot of limitations with regards to output power, but it is decent just for getting a scope, and this is wound with a dual inductor. Um, so there's one inductor wound in each direction, or the pads rather, crisscross. So yeah, we're gonna use this for our experiments today. There are two questions that we want to answer. First of all, we wanna see if we can replicate that damped oscillation from the impulse response. So that'll be a light load test We'll be monitoring the output voltage with a light load on the output, and that should tell us pretty definitively whether or not uh, we're seeing that, well, what we simulated. And we should, right? This is a linear tech part. I picked a linear tech part simply because um, I figured I could simulate it accurately in LT Spice, and well, if it doesn't, that's a shame. Uh, we're gonna turn this on, and we should see Look at that. I'll print this so I can zoom in for you. But that is like perfect. Where does this come from? Of course, when the switch is not switching, we can see the pulse on, off, and then whoosh, 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 technical term. And that oscillation is, well, when the voltage goes positive, so that's the forward current pulse that's making the output voltage go up, and then the diode stops conducting, we get a negative voltage, and then it goes back up, but it's not quite as high, and that energy is going between the, the capacitance that's still in play here, which is C in and C1, and the two inductors, L1 and L2, which in this case is on a common course, or coupled inductors. That is where that is coming from. So now we can see with that one mega ohm resistor, there is a periodic element at about 500 hertz. If I remove this, it is about 380 hertz. Plug it in. So that means this converter is operating in something like a pulse skip mode. Very, very common for a switch mode power supply. So what we would expect is as we increase the load, and this is a 10K, it's so going from one meg to 10K. If I plug this in, we would expect to see an even higher frequency. Oh, and we do. Let's zoom in a bit more. You can see now we're at about 20 kilohertz. If I zoom in just to get one pulse, you can see we still get quite a bit of that resonant behavior. <gasps> okay, okay, let's clear up the confusion here because this big dumb idiot is making a whole video about resonant versus oscillatory and he explains the difference about the oscillatory and the resonant and this. And then he has the audacity to go ahead and say resonant when he clearly meant to say oscillatory. So yes, like I was saying, let's clear up the confusion here. This is very clearly a 
oscillatory behavior. This is very clearly an oscillatory behavior, and resonant would be if we're driving this circuit at a frequency where the inductor and the capacitor were at uh, equal magnitude for their uh, reactants. So, anyways, oscillatory, oscillatory. Say it with me, oscillatory. And as we increase the load more and more and more, eventually we will get to a place where the next switching cycle is going to encroach on that resonant behavior. <sighs> you know, I just... <sighs> Never mind. And that's what we saw. Now this resistor might get screaming hot. Uh, it's a 200 ohm. I haven't done the math, but it'll be 12 volts. I think that'll be a little more than what this is rated for. There you go. And there you go. Now you can see pretty clearly what I was trying to say. On that switch node, you'd basically have an inductor with no current through it, so therefore no voltage across it. And we would switch that 12 volts down to ground. And in that resonance, if we were switching at the resonant frequency, you'd see it go down, up, down, right? We'd pull it low, it'd go up, down, and then we'd switch again when it would be that low voltage. Or you know, if you get some multiple of it, right, you get a relatively low voltage. But ideally, we want that switch to switch at, a low, as, at as low of a voltage as possible. In order to do that, we, that that is zero voltage switching when we're turning on that FET, when there's minimal voltage across it, and then therefore there's minimal switching losses, all you'd really get is conduction losses. And conduction losses can be optimized because you don't need to switch as fast. You don't need to turn on in a microsecond and get through that resistive region of a MOSFET. You can just jump straight to those conduction losses because of the zero voltage switching. You can see, because we have that voltage spike, and then you can see when the MOSFET turns on, for that part of the switching cycle. This is clearly not zero voltage switching. And as we increase the load, we'll see more and more and more until eventually um, we're just in that fixed frequency operation. I don't know if this is really in the fixed frequency range yet. I don't remember if this is supposed to be 1.8 meg or two megahertz. Okay, whatever, I am getting distracted. What I want to see is the single pulse response. So let's set this up. Function generator feeding a pulse train into this system. And I'm hoping that at some point we will start to see some voltage. All right. All right, now we're starting to get into that fun zone. Okay. Let's look at what's going on here. Did we get one pulse? Yeah, so we're getting one pulse. And there is some weird behavior going on. We're getting very different pulse widths. And that's probably just a function of how this converter is running. It's not made to be PWM'd like this. We're pushing this thing beyond what it was made for, but that is still very, very interesting to see the supply operating in this manner. So what do we learn? We learned two important things from these experiments. First of all, we learned that with a single switching pulse, energy does move from the input to the output. We can see the switch node goes from the input voltage, pulled down to ground, let's go, goes to an output voltage that is higher, and we dump some energy into that output. Hopefully I was probing on the right spot. If I wasn't, I just confused you more than I helped. <laughs> oh. We also learned that the SEPIC converter is oscillatory in nature. It can be resonant, but it doesn't need to be resonant. 
There's a lot more to the theory of operation here that we didn't really touch, but as we talked about, Great Scott just did a video that went a little more into those details, so I'll put a link down below. Check out his video if you'd like to learn more about the SEPIC, and uh, I'll drop a couple links in the description as well. Well, I may not be the first to discuss a SEPIC, but I did still have some fun. I have a couple more ideas for some future videos, so keep an eye on the channel. I think we're going to have a lot of fun here. As always, I want to give a special thank you to our channel members on Patreon and YouTube. I really appreciate the extra step you've taken to support us directly. Thank you. I'd also like to thank you all through your support, through any means, through sharing what we do with others, watching, being subscribed, liking, interacting in any way. I really appreciate it. I am often humbled and just amazed at how this community has been growing, and that just can't happen without you. So thank you. As always, I hope you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching it, Eve, for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye.